Hello. 2020. What a strange year, huh? So strange that it has united the world for once. We all have a common enemy, Corona, and a common best friend, Zoom. For me, the strangeness of 2020 is magnified. I sit behind a computer to make an acceptance speech when I could have been receiving the award live amidst all of you in the very lovely Dehradun. But here we are, separated by Corona and continents, united by the internet. I'm excited to be speaking to all of you and so honored to receive this award for the best work in fiction for my novel, The Radiance of a Thousand Suns. My thanks to the organizers and jury of Valley of Words Festival 2020. I would also like to thank my publisher, Harper Collins, my editors, Udayan Mitra and Prema Govindan, and all the fine folks who help distribute, market and retail books. At the time of this pandemic, amidst lockdowns, quarantines and people suffering, you may ask, why bother with books? Why indeed? A book can appear a fragile thing in this world. And yet, book sales surged during lockdown. People managed to stay alive by hiding between the covers of a book. Winning a book award this year is an affirmation that some people found refuge in my novel too. The Radiance of a Thousand Suns is a family saga about women's struggle to tell their stories amidst patriarchy and the cultural trauma of partition. Moving from India to America and across generations, the novel retells the history of independent India via a female gaze. Lockdowns resulted in a reduction in seismic noise. As human beings sheltered in place, the earth became more still. Stillness, contemplation. Is it any wonder that we turned to books? Reading is an act of meditation. The flipping of pages akin to the rolling of rosary beads. The shock waves of human activity travel through rocky ground and ricochet around the globe. Geologists know this from decades of listening for earthquakes with seismometers. Writers are also geologists of a kind. We listen to the shock waves of human civilization, some that still ricochet despite the passage of time and record these with words. Now I want to share with you why a book such as The Radiance of a Thousand Suns had to be written, what my motivations were for writing this novel and how that personal journey went. Heads up, not so well. But let's begin at the beginning. The history of independent India has literally been his story. A story where the independence of India is celebrated with nary a mention of its concomitant partition. A story of male narratives of freedom struggle with the female narratives of pain, humiliation, and extraordinary courage cast aside. Women bore the brunt of the violence of partition and the anti-Sikh pogrom of 1984. Yet, our collective amnesia has buried both in the sands of time and indifference. Survivors of partition are dead or dying, and those who survived 84 are yet to receive justice or compensation. The Radiance of a Thousand Suns attempts to reconstruct this, his story, and add to it the silenced stories of women. What we have to ask, why should it be so? Why this silence? What does partition have to do with patriarchy? In women, Patriarchy has long placed its deepest fears. The fear of women as equal beings. The fear of women who know their minds. Of women who speak their minds. Women who exercise agency. So what does patriarchy do? It dresses up 
those fears as virtues of honor, tradition, culture. So insidious is the patriarchal system that it recruits women as patriarchy's foot soldiers. Be the mother-in-law who perpetuates a spiral of abuse on her daughters-in-law, the mothers who warn their daughters to shrink themselves constantly in presence of men, the wives who abort female fetuses in the goal to procure male family heirs. The hunting down and burning of women is not limited to India alone. The phenomena is global and ancient. King James VI, he of the famed King James Bible, who got the holy book translated into English, was the very same man who violently pursued women in his native Scotland and burned them as witches. In the US, women have actively fought women's right to vote. In the 1970s, Phyllis Schlafly, a self-described housewife, led a conservative campaign against the Equal Rights Amendment, which would give women the same rights as men. How then do we fight these notions of a woman's place in society? Her subservient position in the patriarchal hierarchy. The idea of her worth not as an individual, but only in her roles of mother, wife, daughter, caregiver. By asking questions, why should a woman be held responsible for the behavior of adult men? By breaking the silence. Let's start conversations around casual misogyny, everyday harassment, systemic genocide, by telling our stories. Stories that shatter stereotypes and silences, that raise questions, that show us possibilities we hadn't considered, by restoring agency to the women in our stories. While women have historically borne the brunt of orchestrated violence, the depiction of the violence has been commodified to an extent that it has become a trope in itself. And yet, the reality is that women's stories are stories of extraordinary courage in the face of violence, in the impossible choices they are forced to make to keep their loved ones safe, to keep living when so much has been snatched from them. In the camaraderie they share with other women, in the stories they tell to share those secrets. I wanted to read a book that would tell me these stories about women. But much as I looked, there was no such book. Toni Morrison's quote came to me. If there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, why, then you must write it. Okay, I said, realizing that I was uniquely positioned to tell this story. My hometown of Firozpur stands Janus faced on the Indo-Pak border. A Muslim majority town at the time of partition, it should have gone to Pakistan. Its verdant fields often see buffaloes wandering across to Pakistan, as do kites during Basan. Only Humans do not, except during the 80s when Sikh separatists allegedly fled to Pakistan for safe havens. At that time, the media had started calling Firozpur a hotbed of militants. Curfews and police patrols became routine, as did shootouts in buses and bazaars. Bindrawale was agitating for Khalistan, a state of the pure to be carved out of India yet again, much like Pakistan in 1947. Grown-ups recalled the cataclysm of 47, which they said was the same parle foretold by the Mahabharat. Women's hushed voices regurgitated stories of partition and stilled at significant moments. My history textbooks had no answers. But grizzled old Kamo, who worked in our house, did. I quizzed her as she ground garlic pods with red chilies for a fiery chutney. Kamo would wave a hand, complain, why bring up the past? Sigh, then start to pull a skein from the tangled ball of her memories. 
It was from Camus that I learned how in the endless summer of 47, amid talk of wand, the upcoming division, a gunny bag full of chopped breasts was found smack in the old bazaar. How the mad woman of our colony was a girl recovered from Pakistan a year after partition who had had to leave her child behind with her Muslim husband. The violence of 1947 replayed in almost identical fashion in 1984, the day Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was shot dead by her Sikh bodyguards. As the seismic shocks of partition ricocheted on 31st October 1984 in Delhi and beyond, a seething stillness descended in Punjab with a statewide curfew. In an era before mobile phones and social media, it will be a while before the true horror of the aftermath of Mrs. Gandhi's killing became public. We know now that in Delhi, the capital of the world's largest democracy, an orderly massacre occurred. Citizens turned upon fellow citizens. Here was partition replaying as rumors circulated about trains full of Hindu corpses arriving from Punjab, women were brutalized in public, men hacked. During Punjab's last decade, actually a 15 year period from 78 to 93, I kept my head buried in books. As a corporate warrior, I sold soaps, advice and advertising, convinced I had broken free of my messy in-between town. In the new millennium, Firozpur returned to me when I was in Singapore. Rather, Firozpur's fields that grew wheat and rice and militants that were fenced with barbed wire on the border, that was slick with blood in 47 and 84. I thought I had fled Firozpur and yet the seismic ripples of a border town were tugging at me in an anodyne first world. By now it was clear to me that the book had to be written and I had to write it, except how? To make sense of my memories, I started asking questions. I had more questions than answers but Kamo had reached Allah. I scoured documentation, but women existed only as data in reports on partition and what was officially called anti-Sikh riots. I soon figured that I would have to seek out people of Kamo's generation to learn what wasn't there on paper. And I would have to seek out women, especially, to learn what was being said, but was not being heard. My research often dead-ended. Women who had witnessed partition had passed away. A few had failing memories, which their children supplanted by regurgitating stories they had heard. Some were so young, they recalled fleeing overnight in their underclothes. Fragments of past, some vivid recollections, contradictions in time and place, non-linear sequence of events. I struggled with all those narratives until I studied trauma and learned how it is encoded and remembered. And I began to understand the significant pauses in women's conversations I'd overheard whilst growing up. Sexual violence alluded to, never spoken of. In 84, as in 47, women spoke of rapes using the euphemism of dishonor of being badly used. By the time I began researching the anti-Sikh pogrom of 84, almost two decades had passed. The struggle for justice had been so arduous that I was lambasted by respondents for raking up the past. What Krishna Sobhati said about partition came back to me as I tried to collect the memories of others. It is difficult to forget, but dangerous to remember. I turn to literature to fill the gaps in my understanding. Kushwan Singh's train to Pakistan taught me more than my history textbooks combined. 
G.D. Koslar's Stern Reckoning was one of the few books that recorded women's testimonies of 47. Urvashi Batalia's The Other Side of Silence put individuals at the center of the epoch. However, literature on the pogrom of 84 was and continues to be limited. The excellent When a Tree Shook Delhi by Manoj Mitta and H.S. Pulka is one of the few insightful accounts of that carnage. Witness testimonies made to the Nanavati and Mishra commissions available online sum up the savagery with brutal precision. I decided then that I would write a novel that would be a testament to these women. In the end, I used a strategy called critical fabulation a term coined by American writer, Celia Hartman, which refers to a style of creative semi nonfiction that attempts to bring the suppressed voices of the past to the surface by means of hard research and scattered facts. In India, the past is forever intruding upon the present. So in my novel, which takes the spiral of violence from partition through the emergency the anti-Sikh pogrom, and 9-11. Sociologist Ashish Nandi has shown through his research how some of the most brutal killings are done by the victims of earlier violence. He says that the birth certificates of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh are written in blood. As a result, the dead are uninvited guests at every gathering. So it is with these dead that I populated my novel, The Radiance of a Thousand Suns. In the writing of this book, it was important to me how I structure the book as well to reflect the theme of trauma. When I conceived my novel, it was clear to me that this narrative would be women's to tell, which I did through a female cast that was formidable, feisty, fearless. And I use the Mahabharat, India's foundational epic, as a leitmotif through the narrative. Draupadi was publicly shamed in order to shame her husband. And this template of male violence has been copied for two millennia. In 47 and 84, men made women's bodies their battlefields. In Radiance, I restore Draupadi to her original form of a woman with agency a woman unafraid to ask questions or display her anger. Despite being half the world, women are its largest minority. Meanwhile, we are a society driven by a seemingly unending spiral of violence. The only way to break this chakra view is to open up to the stories of women and fold them into our national and social history. As Nikki, my novel's protagonist, tells her daughter, as long as there were stories to tell, there was a way to connect. Thank you.